and stand this morning and open up with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you so much for all that you do for us. Thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord, that is never ending. Lord, your mercies are even new this morning. Lord, great is your faithfulness. God, we, praise that, we pray that you would uh, just meet with us this morning, Lord, as we lift up your holy and precious name. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing out that song, Shout to the North. We go back a few years. Shout to the North. Good morning, everybody. How are you? You can have a seat. Ooh, good hand motions. Hey, no, you need to sit down. <laughs> hey, we're so You're glad to see you here this morning. We are Resonate Church. We are excited to see you and being able to worship here together. Isn't it neat how much snow we have this winter? It's pretty awesome, I think, anyways. A um, couple of announcements that we have for you. First of all, um, if you are a student youth ministry, we will be doing youth ministry here at the church at, all right, at 6 o'clock. That's our um, oldest student. Yeah, yeah. Uh, woo! Uh, 6 o'clock here at the church, so hopefully we'll see you here for that. Um, Any Packer game going on? With well, we're not going to talk about that. Okay. No. Just curious. Okay. Is there a game going on? Nah. No. All right. Yeah, uh, there is, but, you know, we didn't. Uh, we, we do want to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, we're going to continuously ask you, if you've been coming here for a little while, um, this is my 
ask and plea at the same time. We continuously need you to help volunteer here the best that you can. So our children's ministry is will continuously grow. Um, but also we have a uh, computer and sound stuff that needs to be ran. And cafe. Cafe. We, we could just use you to help do some of these things. So if you're interested in helping, please... Not even if you're interested, you don't have to lead any of these things. We just need you to help volunteer, and uh, we just need bodies and adults to help run these things. So please, if you can, we're going to ask you to step up a little bit and do that. Uh, yeah, and if, if I'm looking out, I'm, there are some qualifications for that. Uh, first is a pulse. Okay, we're good. I think everybody qualifies. Good. All right, so we're good with that. So, yeah, if you have a pulse, you qualify. There's also little things like cleaning up afterwards. You can sign up to clean up, clean up after the service and stuff like that. So, um, but also we have a new thing with with uh, tithing and you know these little buckets. Some people like to do digital instead of paper. If you're one of those folks, we've now gotten established our uh, tithe tithe by text. Uh, we'll, we'll have that probably launching. It's, 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 it's ready to go, but we're probably going to launch it next week. It'll be as simple as, as typing in 84321 on your phone, and that will take you to our, to our Tithe by Text page. It asks you some information, uh, you know, little things like blood type and things like that. No. Um, but anyway, then after you set up your, your, your system, from then on it will just be 50 cent, and it will send out, you know, whatever, whatever you need to send. Um, and as we go on, if there's a special event, you can even say 50 youth, and it will send it to a youth department or something like that. So anyway, yeah. that, that'll be, that should be up and running. It's up and running now. We're probably going to put it out next week. So one thing we do want to add to that, we are not allowing you to add a credit card onto your church account because yes. we do not believe in getting you into debt just to give to the church. It just doesn't make any sense. All and right? then on so, the other side of it, just so you know, it costs us 2.7% plus yeah. another 35 cents per and with the ACHs or out of your bank account, it's there's a 25 yeah. cent charge. So please don't link a credit card is yeah. what we're asking. Yeah. All right. Um, other than that, I don't think we have that much announcements. If you are wanting to be a part of the life here at Resonate Church, we do have a ton of small groups that you can be a part of. We'd love for you to jump in on one of those. Uh, we would love we love doing life together. That's what our whole goal is here. So uh, please jump in on one of those. Today is a special day. Either churches are selling celebrating it around basically the United States last week, or they're celebrating it this week. Um, and on January 27th, 1984, Ronald Reagan issued a proclamation designating that that day as the first day of the National Sanctity of Human Life Day. All right, so today we are remembering um, children, born, unborn. We are making a pledge that we will fight for those that are unborn, um, coming alongside of moms, all of that different kind of stuff. We're going to watch a video here in a second just kind of explaining what Sanctity of Life is, but I also am going to go a step further and just say, hey, if you want to help, uh, because we continuously believe that, we want to support young moms, teenage moms, so you should have received an email this week. We are uh, partnering with a group in Beloit, who's also a group here in Janesville. Uh, they have young teenage moms, uh, and we're going to raise money and, and if you want to bring some diapers and wipes uh, just so we can show them, hey, we, we support the decision that you made and we want to love on you, all right? So diapers, wipes is what we're looking for. If you would like to do, um, just write out a check or give some cash, uh, just put it in an envelope and put uh, Robin House on it and we'll do that, all right? But here, let's watch this video and it will explain more about the sanctity of life is.
Father, you are so good. We are so thankful for the opportunity to worship here with you this morning. God, we are here for you. And so, God, we ask you to do things in our hearts maybe that we're not even ready for. But, God, we are asking for you uh, to be here and to work a miracle in our lives. Father, we thank you for the gift of children, of what we just got to watch on, on this short video. We thank you that they are a gift from you. God, may we be a church that fights for life, that we say to young moms, to young dads, we want to come alongside of you and help you fight for life because each child is a gift from God, and God, you have a plan for each one of them. So God, may we be a church that helps support those in this community to choose life. God, we're asking you to do a miracle in, in this church, in the state, in this, in this country, as we remember the importance and the holiness of each of life. God, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand again together as we continue our worship and song. I just wanted to say, um, before we say this, they should actually name today uh, Resonate Twin Day. We actually have probably the most sets of twins in our church building at one time. I think we have four sets of twins today. Three sets of kids and some visitors who are twins. It's so great to have you guys here. But that's just amazing to me. Three, four sets of twins. So I'm so excited about that. Thanks for coming. Uh, and thanks for being here. This song that we're going to sing is called Resonate. And Jesse has mentioned this several times um, about what resonate means. It means to reverberate a beautiful sound out. And we want to do that with our voices this morning. So as we sing out these next few songs before the message, uh, just ask God to prepare your hearts and minds for what he has for us today. Resonate, 
resonates your glory. Let all living things praise you with one voice. We will resonate, resonate your glory. Amen. Amen. From Colossians 2, verses 6 through 10. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have been feel, filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. Amen. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid by your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Fear not, he is with us, oh be not dismayed, for he is our God, our sustainer and strength. He'll be our defender and cause us to stand, upheld by his mercy, almighty hand. How firm, how firm. Jesus as Lord will press on enduring the darkness of storm. And though even hell should endeavor to shake, he'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. He'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Sing out how firm, how firm. Foundation, amen. 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 Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. When he shall come, with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other 
ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. You may be seated. Forward to uh, to come and grab these baskets. If, if you guys, if you're regular tenders, you know what this basket's for. If you're visiting with us, please go ahead and just let let them go past. Um, you know, you don't have to pay for the pay for the service that you're attending and enjoying. So uh, this, is for, this is for our members and the people that are regular attenders here so that we can propel the, the, the ministry of uh, and what God wants to do with us. So let's pray for this offering, and then we'll move forward. God, thank you so much for being a firm foundation. Uh, thank you that you're not shifting sand. We know that the world is. We can see it. Uh, we can see it in our, in our community, in our culture, in our society, uh, that the world shifts in the sand. Uh, just can't hold us in a firm foundation, but you do. God, we trust you. One of the ways we show our trust is with our tithes and our offerings to you because we know that you have the best purpose and the best use for, for these offerings. God, you're an incredible God. We love you. We praise you. We pray that you will bless these gifts and I pray that you will continue to bless the ones who give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we get to continue with worship. Uh, uh, this is worship as well, but we get to continue in worship as a community by offering a time called Three Questions. And so during this time, uh, we read a text, and then we open it up for discussion for, for everybody here. Uh, and we do that in the format of asking three simple questions. So we're going to read a passage. We're going to read three questions. They're very simple. First, first question is, what does this passage teach me about God? Because we can't know anything about life until we have a firm foundation on um, what we know about God. So first question, what does this teach us about God? Second question, what does this teach me about myself and my community? Third question, how am I going to apply the things that I just learned about God, myself, and my community? How am I going to apply it in life? What am I going to do as an outflow of the things that I've learned? All right, so those are the three questions. What does this teach me about God? What does it teach me about myself and my community? How do I apply it to my life? Here's the passage. It's going to be very similar to the song we just sang. It's in Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49. And uh, this is what Jesus says. He says, Why do you call me Lord and not do what I tell you to do? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. So, listen to what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose... The stream broke against that house and could not shake it because he had been, it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. All right, so there's the passage. They're going to continue to scroll it behind me so you guys can continue to look at it and pull more information out of the passage. All right, so, but here's the, here's the question to you. What does it teach you about God? What does it teach you about yourself, your community? How do you apply it to your life? First question is yours. What does this passage teach you about God? Yes, sir. God knows who his own are. All right? God has identity. But he, knows, he knows who his own are because there's relationship involved with them all right what else does it what else does it teach you about god yep god is the firm foundation all right god is the firm foundation he knows his own
Okay. All right, so if you, well, you have a foundation. How about to do this? If you don't have God in your life, you're depending upon the world. The world is sand. And so your foundation is based upon the sand. Yeah. So you don't have a good foundation. Yeah. All right, so without God, there will, God is a firm foundation. The world is a poor foundation. All right, what else does it teach you about God? Yep. Okay, so God is going to, and I'm going to prompt you the same way I did, okay. So if God's going to be there when the storm comes, that means he knows that storm is coming, and he allows the storm to come. All right? So God knows the storm's coming, he allows the storm to come, and he's going to be with you through the storm. Okay, yep. God is listening. God listens because he's waiting to see if you respond and see how you, how you react. Go ahead. Oh, that part. Yeah, okay. So God is listening. He starts off, why do you call me Lord, Lord? He hears the things you say. Why do you call me that if you're not going to do what I ask you to do? <clears throat> so he's prompting you to listen because he's, he's, he's speaking. He's listening. It's not just a monologue, right? He wants a dialogue which forms a relationship. That's how he knows you're yours. All right, so what else? Anything else about God? If you are seeking God, he will reveal himself to you. God, it, God is not just going to go, nope, 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 nope. If, if you come to God, God is faithful, he's righteous, and he will reveal himself to you. All right, what else? Anything else about God? All right, here's the story that you guys just told. God is a speaking God. He is a listening God, which means he is a relational God. That means he's a, he, he is a God who enjoys communication. He wants you to be involved in that communication. He is watching. He is listening. He knows that storms are coming. He knows the future. He knows all things. He knows the storms are coming. He allows the storms to come so that you will call out to him in the midst of that storm. And then he will walk with you, not around the storm, but right through the middle of it. He will walk with you. He's not going to make the storm miss you. He's going to walk with you through the midst of it. And because of that, you can, uh, through that, you build a firmer foundation. You build a firmer relationship with him. And on the opposite side, if you don't have him, that's, why you're, that's where you're going to get washed away. All right? So there's the story that you guys just told. Uh, what about the second question? What does it teach you about yourself and your community? All right, so if God is providing a foundation, he expects you to build on it. What purpose is going through the process of digging a foundation, putting in rebar, dropping in your concrete, and putting in your ports, if you're not going to build the walls? So if God's going to provide the foundation, he wants you to build upon it. All right, what else does he teach you about yourself and your community? Okay, we need to trust him and listen. I'm assuming you're talking about through the through the storms. Is that what you're talking about, or just in general? Yes. yes. <laughs> Circle that one. Yes, we need to trust him, and and trusting is trusting in listening. Sometimes means you tune out those other voices and those other sounds in life, right? So you know, getting your getting your frequency right so that you listen to God. All right, so trust is I'm not going to listen to that. I'm going to listen to you. And then there's then acting upon what you've heard. So trusting God to listen to him as your, as your source of information. What else? So the first part of it, you know, why do you say to me, Lord, Lord, if you're not going to do the things? Yeah, so, so sometimes we do things, so we need to be careful that our heart reflects our actions. That you don't just do things to signal, the, signal a Christendom or signal some sort of virtue, but your heart is actually right. Because that's where the relational value with Jesus Christ begins, is in your heart, right? So make sure that your heart matches up with your actions, your actions match, match up with your heart, otherwise you'll be spiritually schizophrenic, all right? So what else to teach about you and your community? There is a way to ah. 
You can weather the storm with the right person. There is a way for you to weather the storm. You may lose a shutter or two, right? <laughs> Some shingles may fly off and fly off the roof a little bit, but you can weather the storm with the right foundation, with the right one coming uh, alongside. I saw a hand over here somewhere. You lost it. I talked too long. Okay. <laughs> we have distractions that keep us sometimes from following God. That's right. All right, so what else, what else does it teach you about yourself and your community? All right, short story. Y'all are giving me like a, a short story here. Yes. Oh, I like that. Okay, so expanding out the motif instead of just you, because sometimes being American, we think about individualism, right? My house, my struggle, but it can be a, 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 a believer struggle as well. So as community, sometimes, you know, we need to be firm in our foundation as a church, as a group body of believers, but that way we can withstand together. And if, if my window cracks, then I, you know, we can I can depend upon you to come and help me, right? Uh, so if I fall in a ditch, you can pick me back up again. So we weather storms by the, the foundation that we have in God, but also by the structure that's built uh, in, the, in the body of the church. Good. I like that. Thank you for that community. All right, what else about ourselves our community? Anyone? So whenever your house goes through the storm and the rest of the neighborhood is down the valley, washed away, going out to sea. Uh, we need to say, make sure that it's not an outward thing. We say, oh, well, but I am strong. No, we say, God is the only way I got through this storm. There's no other way I could have gotten through this without, without God and my community at, at the church. To be able to point people to not your building abilities, but to God's foundational abilities. All right, good. What else? Anything else about yourself, your community? All right, so, Yes. Yeah, the storm is, the storm she's a coming, right? The storm is going to come. Go ahead and expect it. Uh, if you haven't had a storm lately, then, you know, grab your umbrella uh, because she's, she's on the way. All right, anything else? Yep. What you're putting on top of that foundation is important also. Mm. If, you're putting, if you're not bracing your, your structure, it's going to, whatever you're putting your extra in on top of that foundation, that's important. All right, so if you, if you build on a good foundation with just sheetrock and toothpicks. It's, yeah, it's probably going to, I don't know, fall. Right. My foundation will be there, but the building's still going to, yeah, so that's part of that community, building in community. Yeah. All right, anyone else? All right, so the story grew, but, all right, so here's the story that you guys just told. God, God provides a firm foundation, so therefore he expects us to build from it. So when we build, we need to make sure that we build it properly, which involves community. That means church life. That means body life. And so that way we don't put weak, weak structure on top of a firm foundation. That way, whenever if I happen to fall, another part of the house can help build me back up again. And God, God wants us to do that because he knows the storms are coming. So we need, as a community of faith, we need to know that the storm is going to come in my life. The storm is going to come in your life. And so whenever that storm does come, maybe the rest of the community is hurt, and you have an opportunity to invite I'm adding this one. You have an opportunity to invite them into your house because your house is still standing. It's not so that you can say, look at what I did. Look at all the external stuff that I did. No, because your heart is one to reach out to people and show them where the foundation was. The foundation was on the Lord and in my church, and that's where I have faith. And I trust him to do that, so therefore I'm going to listen to him. And I'm going to try to bring people into the structure that God has built because it's, it's for his glory and not for my own. And that way I can, I can tell people who have been damaged by the storm, not that I survived the storm better, but my Lord provides a better foundation for life than what the world provides, right? So that's the story that y'all told. I, think, I hope I got most of it. All right, now, application. I will do what? I will what? What have you learned from these things? I will what? What changes today? I will come to him and hear him. 
listen to him, uh, is that he, he would come to me and here's me, if he doesn't hear my voice. Well, you got to first come and hear. Mm -hmm. So come, hear, do. do. So I will come to Jesus, I will listen to him, and then do what he has commanded. Okay? I will? good house on his firm foundation. I will build a good house on his firm foundation. I will I will weather the storm if I'm, my foundation is in Christ. I will be able to weather the storm if my foundation is in Christ. I will I will be careful what I put on my foundation. I will be careful and thoughtful about what I put on my foundation. I will Anyone else? She will second that. <laughs> I will. Anyone else? All right. I will give it to you so you can dismiss the little ones. Well, I can dismiss the little ones, but I don't know if I have to preach much because you just kind of hit everything I was going to. Thank you very much. I don't know why I follow you all the time. That's just not fair. All right. Hey, uh, if you are, what? I know. They just wrote the sermon. Awesome. Hey, if you are a child, um, you may leave. If you are not, you need to stay here. But we have a children's ministry at this time. So if you'd like to go to our children's ministry, you are more than welcome to do that. Uh, downstairs, I believe, is where they are at today. The rest of you, we are going to look at the kind of same kind of passage in the book of Matthew. All right, so ba Matthew. Matthew is the first book of the Old Testament. If you didn't know that, we are in Matthew chapter 7. All right, so if you want to open there, that would be great. We're going to look uh, at starting at verse 24 is what we're going to do. All right? Hey, let's, uh, let's, let's uh, open up in a word of prayer. All right? God, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. I love hearing the importance of community, of, of either saying it together or even just talking scripture together. Father, thank you for the love of community. We are so thankful to be able to be here. We're so thankful to be able to, to grow together. So Father, I pray as we, as we open up your word, may we continue to grow together. And it's not just we read your word and then we forget about it, but God, may we see these people that are amongst us here today. And may we almost make a charge to ourselves to help each other in this walk that you have called us to live on. God, I pray as we open up your word, may it be what it says it is. May it be like a double-edged sword. May it pierce our hearts and change us to be more and more and more like you. God, thank you for the solid, firm foundation that we can build upon. God, we pray that you continue to help us build this home. In your name we pray. Amen. So there are a, a couple of things that I thought about starting with, but, um, you know, I think the uh, clearest one that I can think of is, you know, one of the privileges I got to growing up in Wisconsin is I got to uh, grow up on Lake Michigan. And uh, Lake Michigan, you've learned lots of different things about Lake Michigan. One, it's not like most lakes in that you can kind of feel the water with your toes and then decide if you want to go swim or not. Um, Lake Michigan is completely different in the fact that you don't dip your toes, you just run and dive right in and say, hopefully my body is going to get used to this because it's going to be cold no matter what, all right? So that's one of the privileges of growing up on Lake Michigan. But the second one, and, and it's what we're talking about today, was the fact that you could just go down and be part of, of sand, you know, and, and sand is fun and dirty and gross, but it's also uh, a great way to exercise. It's a great way to build stuff. I remember when I was in high school, we used to have soccer practices on sand because it would make you work so much harder in the sand. I remember building uh, sand castles and, and spending so much time on these sand castles and, and buying different uh, different tools to be able to build these sandcastles, and then suddenly you'd go back there the next day anticipating to see a little bit of the remnant of the so much time you put in the day before, and, and the rain or the dew or whatever knocked down your castle, and it was devastating. I mean, that's, that's the obvious, clear thing of where we can go down in this path of what we're reading and what we're studying today, but 
I want to ask you a simple question, and, and this is, we just talked about building a foundation, right? And, and this is an easy answer for most of you, or you think it is, is, you know what, in the house that you're building right now, in the, in the home that you're building right now, and that's referring to your life, would you say that there is one thing, if someone could dig deep or look inside of you and say, hey, that's, that's what that person's life is about, would it be that solid foundation of Jesus Christ? Or would it be something else? Would it be something that you think that you're building your life upon something else? Because we're going to look here in a minute. As the storms come and as they take things away, Jesus is saying, hey, if you, if you build your life on me, that can't be taken away. But if we continuously build on different things and build our mansions and everything on different things, he's saying, if that were to be taken away, would you just crumble? So I want you to think about that. What is it that I am building my life upon? As we open up uh, to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, I, wanna, I don't want to say I'm going to change Scripture because that's never a good idea, and a pastor would basically crucify himself if he did that, right? But if you are looking in your Bibles, if you have a different version than the ESV, there is a different first word in here than everyone, all right? So the ESV begins this, this passage with everyone, but most of your Bibles, if it is not ESV, starts with a different word. And the word there is therefore, all right? So if, if there is a word that starts with, or if there is a passage or something that starts with therefore, it means that there is something before that he is pertaining to. And, and every, almost every other version of the Bible but the ESV starts with therefore. And if you've been here with us for the last, oh, it's been almost a couple of months now, we've been studying something called the Sermon on the Mount. And this is Jesus' sermon to a bunch of people, a bunch of religious people that are saying that, hey, it is by my works, it is by the law that I've become strong in my religion. And he's preaching to them and saying all of these different things. And he's, he's shaking them. And here this week, here he's saying, all right, now that I've said all of these things, he's saying, therefore. In other words, here is where it's all coming together. And Jesus shares a story that everybody can understand. And I was, and I was studying, the, the, as I'm studying the Sermon on the Mount, I'm sitting there, I'm like, why wouldn't you start your sermon with this? You know, like, why wouldn't you start your sermon with talking about building your house on a firm foundation? But instead, Jesus ends everything with it, with his therefore. All right, so let's look at this. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. It's going to be very similar to what we just did in three questions, but here it is. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them and does not do them, excuse me, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So first of all, today's message is, is called Two Builders, because we see two different builders here, right? If you are visiting with us over the last three weeks, we've been studying a, a series called Two. We looked at uh, two gates, two sheep, and now two builders, but what we have to see here first is that there are some similarities here between these two builders, all right? The first similarity we see is that they both hear Jesus' words. You see that? In verse 24, it says, everyone who hears these words of mine. And in verse 26, it says, and everyone who hears these words of mine. In other words, everybody here is going to hear Jesus' words, now, he is somewhat specifically talking to those people sitting on the mountainside. But this is also everyone who's going to be reading this or hearing about Jesus. Some of you may be saying, because I 
No, I've talked about this. Well, is that including, well, like everyone, Jesse? Are you, is he talking about everybody here? How are they going to hear about this message if, right? Well, I want to take you to Romans chapter 10 because that's exactly talking about it. How, is he talking to everyone or everyone inside the church? Here's what Romans chapter 10 says. It says, how then are they uh, going to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed that he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Now, verse 18, here's where I was kind of going. But I ask, have they not heard? This is what Isaiah is saying. Have they not heard? Has everyone not heard? And here's what Isaiah says. He says, indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all of the earth and their words to the end of the world. In other words, everybody. You know, like there's scripture passage talking about that the wilderness, that plants cry out to the Lord. Everybody knows the Lord. So in, in a way, this is exactly saying that, that everyone who hears these words of mine, what is your choice going to be? So to you, you must point people to hearing Jesus' words, not your words, but Jesus' words. First thing we see is simul similarity is that they both hear Jesus' words. The second thing that we see here is that they're both building homes. Now, it doesn't say that the homes look different, right? It just says that they're building two homes. One is building a home on a foundation. One is not. They are both building a home. You need to see that. That's important for you to see. But thirdly, the similarities here are that you have talked about this numerous or a lot already, is that both of them are going to be encountering storms. Now, I know we, we think we know this, and I know we think we live by this most of the time, but if you are a believer in Christ, that does not exempt you from troubles in your life. Now, I know we, we know that and we read that and we hear that here when we come to church here, but you truly have to know that in your heart, that you are not exempt from trials and problems in your life just because you wave your white flag and say you believe in Jesus. Both of these homes, it says, are going to encounter storms. So if you are encountering a storm right now and you say that you are a believer, don't fret. Don't think that you've lost your salvation. Don't think that your, your faith isn't deep enough. It says here that both of these homes are going to encounter storms. But then we see some differences in these two builders. Here are some of the differences. One, we see that one heard and obeyed, all right? So we said before that everyone hears, but we see that one home, they heard Jesus' words and then they obeyed. We see that the other one, they heard Jesus' words and then they walked away, basically, and just began to build their house. We see another one where we see one man is, is called wise and the other one is called foolish. That's another difference. We see another difference in that one is built on a foundation. The other one just kind of started building walls and began to build his, his house on whatever, on, on sand it's called here. But fourthly, just like as those saying that as the storms hit, we see two differences. In one, that when the storms hit, one remains standing compared to the other one, that when the storms and, and the waves and the wind comes, it will fall to a great crash. Those are the similarities. Those are the differences. And I know many of us, I mean, we're sitting here today, we would say, well, I'm sitting in church, so that probably means that I've built my life on a solid foundation. But Remember, Jesus has been going through this sermon for quite some time. And, I mean, we've been going through it for months. It's not like Jesus is sitting on the mountainside and, and preaching this for months because that would be a really long time. 
But remember, he's going through this sermon and he's saying, okay, now that I've said all of these things, now that you've heard all of these things, build your life on a solid foundation. And he's saying, I am that solid foundation. So what we're going to look at today are five things. Five things how to know what your house is built upon, or five things how to know your house is built on the foundation. All right? Five things. Hopefully it's not going to take us too long. I mean, months would be really bad, but there's a Packer game at two, so we'll try to get you out of here by then. All right? But here's what it is. I mean, Baptist preachers are only supposed to have three. I mean, I've been told that numerous times, but, but here's five for you today. All right? So just bear with me a little bit. But I think this will help you as we conclude this Sermon on the Mount. This will help you to say, hey, how do we know, how do I know that the, the life that I've been given here on earth, is it truly built on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ? And here's what I think he's saying. First of all, we're going to say this. My, the simple statement is, my blank will show that my house is built on the solid rock. All right? So first of all, my surrender will show that my, what my house is built upon. You know, in Psalm 127, verse 1, this all starts by saying that the, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. So if you don't recognize that the life that you are living truly doesn't belong to you, that is the first thing that you need to recognize. You have to surrender your life over to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords, to the one who sustains the building of the house. You have to recognize the importance that he owns your life. And in, in a different passage, it talks about that you were of uttermost importance and that he bought you with a price. So it says, therefore, honor God with your body. Paul says that. You were bought with a price. You must surrender your life to him. You must surrender your house to him. We've been talking about this a ton. Over the last two weeks, we've been talking about a simple statement of while you build your house, or before you build your house, you have to count the cost. We've been talking about that this isn't just an easy, simple decision, but it's extremely important that you count the cost before you build your home. Or build your life on Jesus. Because it isn't a simple prayer. It isn't a simple walking down the center aisle. But it is saying, I am committing my life and surrendering my life to be a ransom for you. This is what it says in Luke chapter 14 about counting the cost. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower, or we'll say a home, does not first, first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man be began to build and was not able to finish. You seeing what he's saying? You have to count the cost. Is this really, truly important to me? Can I truly surrender my life to him? Have I truly surrendered my life to him? I love the, the passage that, that Hoyt just did with three questions, the, the kind of the piggybacking uh, passage of this according to Luke. Luke says in, in chapter 6, verse 48, he says, we will have to count the cost by the way that we dig down to find that foundation. Did you ever think about that? Have you, I mean, have any of you ever built a house before? It, it's not like you can just pick a piece of land and then just say, plop it right down. You have to, you have to dig deep down into the ground to be able to build your foundation, to make it solid and sturdy. And that's what Luke says. He is like a man who's building his house, who dug deep, who counted the cost, who looked at what it's going to cost, what it's going to be if I were to surrender my life, what it's going to look like. He dug deep to found, find that foundation. And then when he did, he laid that foundation to begin the building of his house. Have you truly dug deep to find that foundation in your life? 
But here's the, the last part of this about my surrender that most churches won't talk about. Do you know when you, you go to build your house or you look for a house, you look, at, look for certain things that are important for your, your family or for yourself? You know, like, what are some important things? I mean, school, right? We got to make sure that the school is a good option for my kids. We got to make sure, you know, like, you don't always get to know your neighbors before you move in, but you might want to get to know your neighbors a little bit. You want to know your community. You want to know your neighborhood. Is there a ton of crime here? Because if there is, I don't want to live here. You do all of this different kind of education to find out if this is the land that you are going to build your house or if this is the land where you are going to raise your family. Here's what the surrender part means there. You have to consider all of that as well when you are serving the Lord because you are basically taking your flag. If you're saying, I'm surrendering my life, I'm building my life on the solid foundation, you are taking your flag and you are sticking it in the ground. And you are saying to the enemy and also to the Lord that this land belongs to the way. This land belongs to Jesus Christ. This home belongs to Jesus. And let me tell you, if you haven't heard this yet before, that is declaring war on the enemy. Listen to what it, uh, uh, Luke says again. He says, Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate, deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Or listen to what John says in John chapter 15, 18 and 19 about declaring a war. If you're surrendering to the king and saying, I'm fighting on your side, you are saying your home is an enemy to the Satan or the enemy here on earth. Listen to what John says in John 15. If the world hates you, that sounds like opposites. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I choose you, chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Y'all, have you seriously surrendered your life to him? Have you seriously counted the cost to say, if this home that I'm building, if this life that I'm building here is going to be Jesus's, I am declaring war on the world. And if you're declaring war on the world, the world might throw you some punches. And that's why Jesus is saying, Build your house on the solid foundation. My surrender will show what my house is built on. But if we go on in this passage, he talks about the importance of not just hearing what he's saying here and, and not just saying in these couple of verses, but he's saying over the past, I can't say couple of chapters because he's not preaching the couple of chapters. He's saying, what I have said now, if you've heard what I've said don't just hear him with your ears, right? He's saying, what are you going to do about it? You've heard all of these things. You've been sitting in this church for a couple of weeks now, right? You've heard all of these things. If your house is truly built on the solid foundation, you've heard your obedience will show what your house is built on. That's what he's saying. You can't just hear. You have to do. But before we go to being doers of the word, I want you to see here that if you truly are a house built on the solid foundation of Christ, you have to listen to him. <laughs> we quickly move to the doers part, right? But some of you have to sit down and say to yourself, do I truly value listening to him? Or do I truly value hearing from him? Because if you do... I don't know about you, but my time with him that I spend with him, it's not like, cool, got that 15 minutes done of the day, check, what's next? I find that when I spend time with him, I desire to spend more time with him. I want to hear more from him. It's not like just an easy check mark and saying, move it along. It's a, wow, that was really great. I can't wait to do it again. How about in an hour? That would be awesome. And some of you are saying, 
Are you kidding me? I don't have the time to do that. Look, do you value hearing from the Lord? Do you truly value from hearing from the Lord? And if you do, he's saying, when you hear from me, I want you to obey me. Here's what 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. It's not okay to just read the Bible and then just walk away. In fact, this is what James says about that. James 1, chapter 22 through 25 says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Listen to the way that James explained this. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. You all ever read that passage and be like, what are you talking about, James? We all look in the mirror and we know what we look like and we walk away. I mean, we, we made sure our hair all looks pretty. We made, for you women, you know, you make sure that your makeup is all perfect. You know, whatever, you're looking in the mirror, you know what you're exiting like. But James is saying, hey, if you, if you read God's word, if you pray and you hear the Spirit speaking to you and you hear him and you don't do them, it'd be like looking at the mirror and then turning around from the mirror and forgetting completely what you just saw in the mirror. Like, I look at JT as he's sitting out here, and I see his beautiful beard. It'd be like me walking out of my home and thinking I've got a beautiful beard when I can't do that. (laughs) He's saying to you, when you read God's Word, when you spend time with Him, don't just hear it, but do what He says. Some of it may be standing up for things that you don't want to do. Some of it may be a little bit more difficult things than you think it should be. Guess what? You have declared war on the world. If you're following everything that the world is doing and you're not obeying God, you're not probably belonging to him because all you care about is fitting in the world. You hear what he says. You do what he says. My obedience will show what my house is built upon. Thirdly, my interior will show what my house is built upon. Here's what I mean by that. How many of you have a home and sometimes you don't want people always to walk into your house because you don't want to know really what's going on on the inside? I mean, some of you, I don't want you all to come to my house right now because it might be a little bit messy. I might have some toys in the living room. I might have some laundry baskets in the living room. I may have some dishes in the sink. I don't want you to see the mess inside of my home. But here's the also deal about my interior. If you were to walk in my front door, you are going to get a clue of to what's important to my family and I. That's family, and that's a relationship with Jesus. My interior is going to show what's truly important to me. My heart, okay, You're, we talk about our life. Your heart is going to show if you truly are built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Do you truly know if you have a relationship with him or not? Do you truly trust that grace has saved you or do you think it's still about the things that you've done or or are you sitting here today and not knowing if you are in a relationship with him or not? Let me take you through the passage of when I first met Jesus. This was a passage that was monumental and life-changing for me. This spoke to what a relationship, to what a heart transformation truly looks like and what it is. This is Ephesians chapter 2. It says, um, among all whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, 
being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. It says, by grace you have been saved. And, and he raised us up with him and seated us, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one can boast. The reason I'm pointing that to you is because if you are here today thinking that just by reading God's word, just by praying, just by putting a couple bucks in the, in the offering plate, or even just sitting here in the church building is what saves you, that's not what the interior you want to see. You see, I would still invite you to my house even knowing the messes inside because I truly want you to see what, what grace looks like in our family. <laughs> Do you have that on your interior? Do you say the relationship with the Lord is what it means everything? And as I do things in my life, it's an overflow of what's happening on the inside. See, that's what Jesus has been saying through this whole Sermon on the Mount. I mean, you want to, you don't trust me, go back and look at Matthew chapter 5. He's saying all of this, you heard that it was said if you do not murder. You heard that it was said, if you do not commit adultery. And all of these Pharisees or these religious leaders are thinking to themselves, they're like, well, I haven't committed adultery lately or in a way that I define it. Or he's saying, you know, like, I haven't stolen from a bank or, or, or I haven't killed anybody today. And they're sitting there giving themselves glove plaps and be like, I'm, I'm fine, right? But then Jesus goes straight to them and says, no, 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 no. Let me tell you, it's not just about killing somebody. If you have anger in your heart, you've already committed that murder. And he's saying it's not about the actions that you do. It's about your heart. He's saying it's about your interior. Why do you do the things that you do? My interior will show what my house is built on. Fourthly, my exterior will show what my house is built on. You know, the tricky thing here is, and I think this is kind of what Jesus is trying to get at here too, is, is that two homes can look exactly the same. Now hear me on this, because this is what Jesus is saying back at kind of what we looked at last week. Listen to what he says in chapter, in, in verses 14 and 15. Excuse me, 15 and 16. Beware of false prophets who came to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs, figs, figs from thistles? See, he's saying these sheep, they look the same. These homes, they look exactly the same, but one is a sheep and one is dressed as a sheep that's a ravenous wolf on the inside. Their exteriors look exactly the same. Jesus says, how are, we gonna, how are you going to know the difference between them? And he says, it's by their fruit. Luke chapter 6, verse 45 says, a good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. Did you see what that just said? The good person out of the good treasure of his heart. In other words, the good person out of the interior of his home produces good. And the evil person out of the emptiness of himself or the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus is saying you can't fake your exterior home. It may look the same. But you're not fooling me, he says. You may have all the bells and whistles. You may be that house that's got all the Christmas lights that everybody comes and sees and they even you know, travel lots of miles to see it because you got the music that matches perfectly up with the lights and everybody wants to come and see it. And, and you think, you know what, if I do all of these things, I'm going to be drawn closer to the Lord. And then you're saying it's about my exterior. But Jesus says in verses 21 through 23, 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many of you will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And did we not cast out demons in your name and, and do many works in your name? Didn't, didn't our exterior, didn't the things that we do show that we belong to you, God? And Jesus says, and then I will declare to them, I, I, I never knew you. I never knew you, and, he, and that's, a, that's a frightening statement on its own, but then he says, depart from me. In other words, get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. Your exterior shows truly what's going on in the interior. You can come to my house, and you're going to see bikes. You're going to see snowmen. You're going to see different things of defining what my home is, and that's a family house. It's the same thing with your home with Jesus Christ. Is what's happening on the inside producing on your outside. We can talk about the fruit of the Spirit all we want. That's your fruit. Lastly, my recovery will show what my house is built on. There are two things here that I think that he's talking about the storms of life. There are two storms that he's talking about. And he's saying that both of them are going to be coming. Here's the first one. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, it says, We are afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. You all ever felt that before? Man, I, it just feels like there's one storm that tops on top of another storm and happens another one, and you just feel like you're attacked constantly, constantly, constantly. And you're like, God, would you just shine down some sun for once? I feel the rain is just falling and falling and falling, and, and the wind is building, and it's, the storm is just trying to knock down everything. Yep, that's true. That's your life struggles. That's what you're going to be going through. That's what Paul is saying here, but you're feeling afflicted in every way, but you're not completely crushed. You're perplexed, but you're not driven to despair. You're, you're persecuted, but you're not forsaken. You're struck down, but you're not destroyed. That's your, your life struggles that you're going through right now. And they're coming. And they're here. But here is the other storm of life, or the other storm that we haven't talked about. And that is the ultimate storm at Judgment Day. That is the storm at the end of life. When, when Jesus comes, and you know, we talked about that narrow gate, and the storm comes and it knocks, you know, that house down and it shakes it. And you can say, Look, my house is still standing because it was built on the foundation. You see, he's saying that if your life is not built on Jesus Christ, your life is going to fall. And he's not just talking about your life struggles here. He, what he's meaning when he says it fell and great was the fall of it, he's talking about eternity. Your eternal life will be destroyed if you don't build your life on Jesus Christ. Have you thought about that? He's given you an option to build your life upon. That when storms in life happen, that you might be shaken a little bit, but you're not going to fall. And then when judgment day comes someday, which is going to come to everybody, he's also saying, if you put your faith in me, when it comes to the judgment day, your house will remain standing because you built your life on me. So we're talking about your, your house. My surrender will show what my house is built on. My, my, in, my interior, my exterior, my recovery, my obedience. Are all of these things, are you showing that your house belongs to the Lord or are you living a life? Are your actions 
proving, where you think, you know what, this was just a quick get out of hell free card and then it's over? Or are you truly saying my life is ransomed and belong to him? Listen to how this sermon ends then. As people are walking away and they hear everything, they're like, man, did I, is, it, I mean, can you imagine what you're thinking as you're walking away from this? You just heard all of this, and he says, you got to build your life on the foundation of me, on the solid rock like we just talked about. Here's what it says that the people walked away from. Verse 28 in chapter 7, and when Jesus finished these sayings, when he finished the sermon, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. They're walking away. I mean, there's probably some of them that are feeling, you know, you're kind of feeling beat up, but you're also astonished because of the authority that he just preached because he's Jesus Christ himself, because he's God himself. So as you walk away today, my prayer to you is you feel the authority of Christ, you feel the reigning of Christ in your life. And you're saying, man, if my house is built like this, if my house is built on the solid foundation and the walls are showing the fruit of the Spirit inside my home, my goodness, invite people into your home to show that solid foundation. Invite people to see your life. Invest in people in your life and show them the house that God is building in your life. We're going to sing a song here. That's probably a familiar one. It's called Build My Life. But as you sing this song, I want it to be a prayer for you. Are, have I or will I choose to build my life on Jesus Christ? God, you are amazing. You are the fact of how this story has all ended this whole sermon, of how you have now put this together, of the importance of building a life on a solid foundation. God, I pray for each and every one of us here. Some of us may have not began to build that life. Maybe our life is just our, our, our homes have been built on, on sand where these storms have hit and, and as things are taken away, we just feel like as things get taken away that our life is over and that we have to start over every single time. So, Father, I pray for maybe that one soul here today that's sitting in this church building or maybe even online that has not yet built their house on the solid foundation of Christ. I pray that today is the day. I pray that today is the day that they say yes to you, to dig deep and count the cost of giving their life to you and surrendering their life to you and being obedient to life, even to death on a cross. God, I pray for that one person here today that is feeling the Spirit moving inside of them to say, take that step of faith. But Father, I also pray for those of us that maybe have made that commitment in our life and, and maybe we're saying we care too much about what the exterior of our home looks like. God, would you help us with the interior? Would you help us to be hearers and also help us to be doers of the word? Would you help us to work on the interior of our homes, the, the hard heart stuff inside, so that out of the abundance of our interior is what our exterior shows. And God, may we have complete confidence and faith in the recovery of the building of our life, whether it's the storms of life now or whether it's judgment day. God, may we have complete faith that you will never leave us nor forsake us that our house is not going to be abandoned, that you purchased us with a price and you will not leave us. God, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing the song, Build My Life. Every breath we could ever breathe, 
live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing it out, holy. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken and i will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and holy there is no one like you there is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. So as you... Again, you leave here today. I, I pray that you understand that if you truly have built your life on that firm foundation, that you also have declared war on this world. And things aren't meant to be super easy for you here. But thanks be to God because he's always victorious. He's always, always going to win. That's the firm foundation that you have built your life upon. So as these storms keep happening in your life, don't give up. Don't give up because that firm foundation, Jesus Christ himself says, you will reign victorious with me. You will stand in the end. So as you leave here, be filled with the Lord. Go build a relationship with someone outside so you can tell them about the firm foundation that you have built your life upon. Have a great week, everyone. We'll see you next week. You are loved. Amen. There is no 